Hello, and welcome back to our continuing series on cloud native application development. Today, we're going to be talking about how to make it more efficient to work in your local development environment with a microservices architecture. In many cases, it's difficult to know whether or not your microservices, your front ends, your clients will all work together unless you can stand up a fully integrated application. And oftentimes that means putting it through pipelines, CI, CD, getting it deployed somewhere in the cloud, and then actually seeing if it works. But that can be expensive because cloud services are not free, or it could take up lots of resources and it could delay getting feedback. So I'm going to show you how you can use certain tools to stand up a running microservices architecture on your local machine. Now, let's take a look and see what our example application architecture looks like. As you can see here, we have uh, a series of five containers. We have an OAuth2 proxy. We have a single page application front end. We have a Snowdrop Spring Boot REST API. We're using Keycloak for OAuth and authentication. And the API is persisting data in PostgreSDB. Now, to start all of these things up, you could do it manually. Uh, it's probably going to be specific to whoever's developer, whichever developer is working on their local machine. Uh, some people may be running Fedora, some people may be running Red Hat Enterprise Linux, some people may be running some other Linux distribution or Windows or Mac OS. And it gets difficult to stand all of that up reliably for each of those named uh, each of those operating systems or workspaces. So what we would like to do is we'd like to use containers. You know, that's the promise of containers. You publish a container, it runs anywhere. Uh, but we then have to worry about how do we wire those containers together? How do we get them to communicate with one another? And that's where this concept of compose files comes in. Compose files uh, as popularized with Docker Compose, but now compatible with Podman via Podman Compose, allows us to use a really simple, short, declarative YAML file to explain, hi, I want all these uh, containers. I want them to be connected with these names, these namespaces, these environment variables, these configuration settings, and I want you to stand all of that up for me, and the Compose engine will do that for you, which is fantastic. So let's walk through this right now. All right. So to get started, what we need to do is we need to start creating our compose file. And we're going to use a to do app to explain this. I'm going to increase the font size here. I'm going to do, I'm going to create a bootstrap directory. And I am going to clone my user interface and my Spring API down locally. So in order to do that, I'm going to copy these commands. That's going to give me my API. This will give me my user interface. And now we're going to change into that bootstrap directory I created, and we're going to start creating a Docker Compose file. Actually, let's do this in VS Code, just to make things a little easier. We'll create a new file, Docker Compose YAML. And the gist of our compose file starts out like this. If you've never used compose, either podman compose or docker compose, what you're going to do is something along the lines of this. You're going to specify the compose file version and you're going to give it a list of services that you want it to start up. Uh, in this case, we're going to be pulling Postgres from Docker Hub. We're going to be pulling Keycloak from Docker Hub. We're going to be pulling down a Maven uh, Java Maven container from Docker Hub. And we're going to also grab the latest version of Node.js. 
And then finally from Quay.io, we're going to grab this OAuth2 proxy that we use to offload authentication from our back end to the front end. But this isn't enough information to stand these applications up. So obviously we need to pass some additional information. So for example, for our database, we need to tell Postgres what the database name is going to be, what the uh, username and password that we want to authenticate with be, would be. So we can do that. One way to do that is with environment variables. So the compose file allows me to specify environment variables that will be passed when the container starts up. Uh, another way we can do it is we can actually customize the command that uh, our container is started with. So for example, on our Maven container, let's say we want to start Maven with a particular set of configurations for our Spring Boot API. Well, we would do that using the command option see that each argument is on a separate line item uh, unless you need to put all of it together like that's why these are quoted so we're gonna run maven clean compile spring boot run we're gonna pass some parameters to spring boot we're gonna pass some parameters to maven uh, we're also gonna pass some JVM arguments that will allow us to start a Java debugger on a port that we can access remotely from outside of our containers. So those are a couple of ways that you can customize how your containers get started with the compose file. I am going to actually jump to a fully completed compose file because I, I can't take the time to go through all of this, but you're welcome to poke around in our repository and test and figure out what exactly it is we did. But we have our to do DB. We have our API with all of its settings. Some things I will call out, for example, we're mounting some volumes. Uh, specifically, I'm mounting the API source code as slash workspace in the container. And I'm also mounting the Maven repository cache so that every time I start up these containers, I don't have to re-download all of my dependencies from Maven. Uh, I'm exposing the ports for the web application itself and the Java debugger. Uh, I'm starting up Keycloak, and Keycloak is actually importing some realms so that we have some example users to work with. And you'll see that the way I did that is I created a key cloak directory. And in that key cloak directory, in the lab instructions, you'll find a realm.json file that you can copy into your own project. Uh, configuring key cloak and exporting and importing realms within key cloak is beyond the scope of this discussion. Uh, but I've set up the default admin username and password, how to import the realm, what kind of database to store Keycloak users. Uh, again, I used the run command to customize how I wanted to start the UI. And again, we're mounting that source code directory inside of the container. That way we can do local development in our IDE or whatever. And it will immediately be visible inside the running containers. And so if we're using a tool like uh, NPM, which can set file system watches, or if we're using Quarkus or, or some other Java environments that can live reload, uh, as we change files, it'll recompile, reload immediately, no need to restart anything. So this is what our compose file looks like, but you'll notice that we've got some environment variables in here. And that means that we also need to script the startup of this compose file. And so I'm just going to call this launch.sh. And in order to script the startup of our compose, we need to figure out some differences between the platform we're running on and the container engine that we're using. 
So for example, uh, by default, we want our containers to run with the same user ID that we're running as. That way we don't end up with permission problems uh, between our source code, our build files, things like that. Uh, we also want to set some volume options to optimize things. So for example, this Z volume mount option for Docker and uh, basically says, hey, if SE Linux is installed on the machine, let's support that. And the delegated on a Mac, because on Mac OS you have to run Docker inside of a virtual machine, inside of a container engine, uh, those multiple layers of abstraction to the file system can cause performance problems. So we want to cache file system read write at the container level. Also, if you're running when Windows and Mac, inside of your Node.js projects, your Node modules may have built some native uh, extensions for Node.js. One, one common example is Node SAS. It actually compiles some C extensions for the Node runtime. Well, if you're on a Mac, that's going to be compiled for Mac OS or Darwin. If you're on Windows, it's going to be compiled for Windows. But your containers, because they're Linux, even if you're on Windows and Mac, they're running in a Linux VM, those Node modules may not be compatible. And so we may want to override where those node modules are being stored. So by default, we're going to use the node modules that's in the source code directory. But if we need to, we can override it and store our node modules in a separate directory so that they don't conflict. And that's where we come to try to detect the operating system type. So on Unix, Linux, and Unix-like operating systems, there is an environment variable called OS type. Uh, if you're not on, if you're on Windows though, this environment variable probably doesn't exist, and so we'll just default to saying that that's Windows NT. So if we're on Linux, we might need to customize some things when we're running on Linux. We could put that in here. If we're on Windows, you can see that we're overriding where those node modules would go. Same thing for Mac OS. So we can put customizations based on platform in this launch script. Uh, you'll also notice that I'm checking to make sure that there's a Maven repository cache directory locally. If not, I create one. Uh, we check to make sure that either Docker Compose or Podman Compose are installed and it'll choose automatically which one. It'll default to Docker Compose and then if it's not available, it'll use Podman Compose. If both of them are not available, in fact, uh, it will exit with a non-zero exit code. At this point, we've detected enough information. We may have some customizations based on our OS, and we just want to feed those environment variables into our Compose. But we want to make check and make sure that our source code directories that we're going to mount exist. If we're running Podman, because Podman will use UID and GID mapping to make the root user map to our user and the root group map to our group on the external machine, we can set container UID to zero. And on Podman, Podman does not support the delegated option. At, but it doesn't really need to either. And so we just change the container volume options. And finally, we run our container engine compose up. We can also pass some extra options if we wanted to run things in the background or do extra debugging or logging. And so at this point, The last thing we need to do is copy that Realm file. And I'm going to just copy it over from a place I have it in my file system. So that's going to be cputility uh, documents with workspace. Copy to that dev. Developer tools. Supporting files. Realm. And I'll put that into my key clip directory. Oh, 
And actually, my launch belongs up one level as well. Let's move that. So at this point, we should be able to run this and have it come up. Now, the way I've configured this script in most in most cases is that you would have export engine equals uh, compose underscore engine and doc. Now, why did I do this? This is so that outside of this script, if you want, if you had both Docker Compose and Podman Compose installed, you could force a choice between your Compose engines. Uh, so if you set this Compose engine environment variable to be Docker, regardless of whatever else happens in this script, you're going to use Docker Compose. If you set this Compose engine variable to be Podman, it'll be Podman Compose regardless. So at this point, we can do change mode, 755, launch. So now we can actually go in here and we can do dot slash launch. And what we'll see is that Docker Compose starts spinning up all the appropriate containers from our Compose file. And we can actually watch all of this come up. And one thing I do want to call out is you'll notice that we have this restart policy defined on the OAuth2 proxy. OAuth2 proxy is heavily dependent on Keycloak. It will not start up until Keycloak can tell it its configuration. And OAuth proxy starts up very quickly. Keycloak, not so much. So this will exit and fail a few times while Keycloak is starting up. As long as you're on Docker Compose, this restart policy will cause it to restart every time uh, until it is configured and until it's up and running. Unfortunately, under Podman and Podman Compose, this restart policy is not yet supported. So once everything else comes back up, you just run a single command, Podman, uh, start, and then the name of this, this single container, and everything will come up. So it looks like we're almost done watching Keycloak come up. Yes, our OAuth2 proxy is listening. We can switch back over to our UI. And if we hit our OAuth2 proxy, and log in, we get to our to-do app which is exactly what we expected. We can actually watch our network configurations here. And let's say complete the compose training. Yay, I did it. And it is complete and it was due today. So we'll add that successfully posts and you'll be like, oh wait, our to-do didn't show up. And I freaked out the first time I did this. I forgot that in this application, I hide the completed items by default. So we did complete the compose training. Thank you for your time. And I hope that this methodology is useful in helping you accept, accelerate your application to delivery.